Hello and welcome to another edition of the Paranormal Quartet from Mexico. I'm your host, Markus Fernheitzer, and this here is my special team. Gary Mannion, hello, welcome the second time. Thank you for having me again. Ah, I'm yeah, very happy and proud to have you here. And like every time, the wonderful Julie Abriani. Hello, hi everyone. And the wonderful Judith Miller. Welcome. Hi, guys. Nice to be back. It's wonderful to have you here and to see that you are doing well. Let me ask about Abraham. Gary, what is he doing when he is not with you working together? Does he have a private life? Um, so he would talk about from where he resides. He's aware of the different lives he's lived on this side of life. Uh, but he's still progressing in spirit. Um, that I don't own him in any way. So he's carrying out healing anywhere he can around the world or whoever needs him. Uh, so he seems to keep himself quite busy. Mm -hmm. um, because I'm, I keep in touch with my family who passed away and they say every time they have a busy life. And... Um, is somehow like they would be uh, reincarnated uh, and they live very similar. And I was quite curious in context of Abraham. He lived, I think, the last time you mentioned 3,500 years ago. Yeah, roughly around. In, yeah. And so um, did he tell you how is uh, the place where he lives now? Is it still this environment he was used to live in or did it change or is it, well, kind of modern world? So he's from a place called Ur, which would be modern day Iraq. Um, so he actually says it hasn't changed much. Um, it's just we've got new tools to help to kind of hurt each other with. Um, now he'll talk about what you say about reincarnation. So he'll talk about he'll have many lives. Abraham being his last personality or the personality he brings through to to work with me. Um, but he'll say that from where he resides, he's aware of all those different lives at the same time, um, and that time works very different for them. Um, so he can experience all that as separate moments, but he's aware it's the same time. Basically, that time doesn't exist. If we say timeline, this would be better because in context of vibration, we reach goals and time doesn't exist. Maybe there's something moving and what we interpret as time, but it is not what we think, basically. Um, is his environment changing where he lives? Because basically we construct with our thoughts here our life, what is around us, and we use hands. On the other side, we think and we create as a group of people, as a single person. How does it work for him? Is he in, in, a, in a stable environment or is it changing all the time? Um, so he talks about when he first passed over that it was very similar to the world he left behind because um, that was his understanding. Um, and as he's progressed, he's moved beyond the material wants and desires. Um, the easiest way he describes it is he's, he's become a lighter being. So he's not bound by limbs or, or a single form. Um, but he'd say for him, his reality is a lot more real than being in our side of life. But I, he's, I was. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Avia. I just want to touch base on since you said the word enlightened, because I, I do know that Abraham also another aspect of his soul is ascended master Almoria. Mm -hmm. So my question is, so all of his many lives collectively um, boost him up. And he, like you said, he, he is an ascended master. So does Abraham enjoy the same type of vibrational um, activity on the other side as, say, Master Almoria? Uh, the same soul? So Abraham would be kind of an aspect of that. So he does say that from, from his awareness, he's aware of all those different lives, those different aspects. Um, but then the kind of personality he brings through, in essence, is a construct. Um, so it's taken that personality up to a certain point. But he's also saying that he... 
that personality and, and that level of understanding, there are aspects of him that he's aware of that have a lot more understanding. Okay. And is it correct that he was also one of his aspects of his uh, life, one of the three kings that brought gifts to Jesus? Oh, it's entirely possible. Um, I don't know if anyone's actually asked that. Um, I seem to have the the grumpy Abraham. Uh, what I mean by that is he's a great character, but Abraham is very almost kind of set in his ways. He loves healing. Um, he's open to things like physical mediumship and mental mediumship, but he'll be very much, you know, that's that's not my bag. It's not the words he would use, but it's not his thing. He's open mm -hmm. to it. But his his main concern as that personality is as um, as a healer. So often when people refer to him as, say, the biblical Abraham, things like that, he'll very quickly make it clear that, that that's a very different person that's depicted in the Bible compared to who he was. Okay. And I just want to also just put in that I got to experience his wonderful healing in mm -hmm. seance. I was picked when I went to New York and saw Gary this past summer. And really everybody in the room could hear the clicking, could hear the almost like a gristle sound of, you know, him working inside on my spine. So it was so amazing. And I didn't feel pain, but I felt pressure of, you you know, surgical utensils actually working. And what was so evidential for me was it was so involved what he was doing that there was a, a time when he moved to the next patient that I felt like I was going to fall. I felt like I was going to collapse because I was so hot and just the pressure and the intensity of it. And just when I thought, oh, my God, I'm just going to fall because I can't move. He came back to me and he put his arm on my shoulder, his hand on my shoulder. And whatever it was, calmed it down. And I was able to stand while the other person got healing. But did did you feel there. his hand on your shoulder? Yes. And his hand started working on the back of my neck. Mm -hmm. in a certain spot wherever I needed surgery. And I actually do have cysts on my spine. I have stenosis. I have, <clears throat> you know, uh, messed up discs. So I literally felt his hands, the tools working and everyone in the room could hear the, you know, the clicking noises. So mm -hmm. it was really amazing. If you speak about clicking noise, do we speak about uh, metal noise and kind of metal noise of um, surgery tools? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, Gary, question. Is a normal surgery, like we know them here on Earth, is it necessary? Or do you say this is something completely what you shouldn't do? You should have trust more in life that you don't get sick. You know which direction I go? I think to be sick is nothing what we are supposed to be in real. It mm. is a circumstance of um, energy who is not working in the right way, if I can put it in those words. What is your opinion about it? So first and foremost, we work with the belief system that the body builds itself and it has the recipe to repair itself. Um, sometimes it might need some stimulation uh, or inspiration, but it, it has the ability to, to fix Can I ask? Itself. However, oh, go on. Sorry, Guy, I wanted to ask. Um, I actually was listening to one of your podcasts last night and it was I was really intrigued because when you're doing the surgery, you're fully awake, you're coherent. Mm -hmm. um, I very much am working the physical. and my physical, I'm fully awake and coherent. Um, whereas I'm very hands-on, like yourself. Um, and when I, I'm also, I my physical is, is the healing, but also for some reason moving objects. It's for loved ones to see that their loved one is right there moving this object doing that it's for, mm -hmm. you know physical evidence in front of their eyes as you were explaining in part of your podcast and when you were explaining you, I, I seen you with your hands on on the actual person and that's how I would do I would put hands on um and I could 
I can feel, I can see. Now, I'm not talking about the tools, but I can mm -hmm. feel and I can sense exactly where that person needs the healing. But again, you can, you, you were explaining, like yourself, you can do that online. Whereas um, I've maybe been family in South Africa. Um, I've done, you know, America, we can do it over online. And you're still visualizing those hands. You can still, I don't know if you can, but when I do it, those hands are still, you're seeing those hands going and being guided to that area of the body. Um, yes. So I was curious, I was just about to, do you see the same when you're doing it online as in the way I'm, I'm explaining it? Yes. Yeah, so when I'm doing it face to face, um, Abraham has full control of my physical hands. So I let them move. I let them do what they need to do. Um, and then while that's happening, I will see and feel additional hands going into the body. Whereas if I'm doing an absent session, I'm more physically, I more meditate. Um, and then I will more observe what Abraham is doing with that person. Um, so it's similar, but it's probably when I'm doing hands on, I'm more physically aware. Whereas when I'm doing absent, I'm more focused on more as, a, as an observer. Yeah. See, I am physically aware at all times. Mm -hmm. um, but also... I, I have also noticed that um, the, the physical side of things, what you were explaining, you know, to when I was listening to you, you know, I, I maybe this is wrong, but I, I firmly believe my guides have said to me, we can cure cancer, we can cure bone disease, we can cure cell within your cells, within your marrow, within everything. Um, and people have come back with conditions purely because they're meant to show and prove that these can't be healed. Mm -hmm. So they can. But when I was listening to you in your interview, I very much got, like, my spirit team have taught me all my physical. And I'm very much, I don't follow the norm. It's like, I, I very much, it's not that they want to break the rules. It's just they have their way. And when okay. I was listening to you, it felt very much like, you didn't follow the you know the strict rigid ways you very much just go with your spirit team and trust them the way i would work um mm -hmm. and is that would that be right yeah so the issue i had is because i started doing mediumship when i was 13 um nobody wanted to work with me they said go away and come back when you're 18. um so because of that i had no choice but to learn from spirit um and then i very much learned that everyone has their own way of doing it and development is really just about understanding how you work and, and what's the best way to bring that forward. Yeah. Um, that yeah. Right question. <clears throat> With healing, what I just want to touch on is, like to touch on your, on your previous question, uh, yes, I believe that anything, any illness we have can be fixed without necessarily having to have intervention. However. But how we can prevent it. Yeah, so this is the however bit. So I think that sometimes physical surgery in the hospital and physical medication is necessary. The reason being is, well, the reason we are manifesting these illnesses is an opportunity to learn and grow. Now, when someone comes for healing, you may have someone that will have one healing session, their problem disappears and they never have a problem again. Or you may be working with someone who's gonna have that problem throughout their life. Um, and the healing is actually helping them to deal with that because the lesson they've chosen to go through may be that they're gonna have that condition throughout their life. And you could have two people with the exact same condition. One gets better, one has it for life, depending what's behind it. Um, so in those cases, sometimes, and I know Abraham has said to people before, uh, with things like worn out knees and stuff, you go, you know, we can work with this and we can get some improvement. If you want to go the quicker route, then go and have physical surgery. That will address the issue much quicker than letting your body heal naturally. Whereas in other cases, the healing alone has been enough for, for knees to repair or issues to go dormant. If we speak about when, let me put it like that, it starts, you start to getting sick, but what is the reason to get sick? Why do we get sick? What is it? I mean, I can get the flu and the doctor will tell me, well, you need um, some medicine. Uh, if you ask him, but what is the reason why I'm getting sick? I'm not supposed to be sick. My condition changed during the time. Is it how we think that we influence the flow of energy? Is it that our, our chakras are not working in the correct way? Is it our fault? Is it the environment? I don't speak, speak about the point of view from a doctor. 
-hmm. I speak about here about energy, flowing energy. So in, well, everything is energy. We've got a nice, healthy energy field. If we don't deal with an energy or an emotion, we're going to store it somewhere in the energy field. Mm -hmm. Over time, that's going to weaken that part of the energy field. And that's where some healing modalities will look at. If you've got a problem with your neck um, or say problem with your legs because you're afraid of moving forward in life, uh, back because you feel unsupported, because generally if you're storing energy in that area, you're going to manifest an issue in that area eventually. Mm -hmm. So the problem we have is with most people, we take the Western approach. As soon as we get a headache, rather than think about things like, why am I getting a headache, such as the most common reason being you're dehydrated, we quickly reach for paracetamol or other pills to ignore the symptom rather than address why we have these problems. And Western medicine just treats symptoms, sadly, rather than addressing why is the problem there in the first place. But we can also... Uh, 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 oh, sorry. Sorry. Let me go, let me go into it uh, uh, once again about medicine. Does the medicine in real help us or the belief that it's going to be the medicine mixture. will help us? It's going to be a mixture. It's going to depend on the individual. Um, yeah, it's going to definitely be a mixture. In, in theory, if we were to look at the bigger picture, we should be able to do it all energetically. But then if we want to use that same argument, the medicine in itself is vibration. Um, healing is a form of vibration. So... Even if we look at healing, some people may benefit from psychic surgery. Some people may benefit from Reiki. Um, it's just finding what's going to work for you. So in those cases, medicine can be really affected, even if it's just from the placebo effect, because your doctor tells you this pill is going to make you feel better, you feel better, um, or because it's containing what your body needs to help you get better. Uh, Judith, sorry, I interrupted you. You're OK. I, I was going to say, um... We also, I've noticed we have also got other, um, we can be stressed within ourselves and not even know we're stressed. Um, mm -hmm. Like Gary was explaining, um, not everybody puts down to the different parts of the body, the, the blockages or whatever, and our energy. Um, personally, I've met other, I've met other people who have, it's, it's made them physically ill. It's, it's created severe physical symptoms but it's all stress related within, and they haven't realized that. Um, so it's, it's left them not just emotionally impacted, but it's left them physically, whereas it's really had a physical impact on their body um, due to stress within that they don't even realize they had. So it can impact on both, like you were you know, saying. Um, and if we can help people understand and um, Sometimes we just need to be that ear to listen to and spend the time with someone that that stress level can just gradually just all of a sudden you're feeling in so much better form. You're feeling better within yourself and you're not feeling that illness like you were maybe 30 minutes beforehand just by being in somebody else's energy and, and, and somebody understanding the situation, but look better. Would you agree, Gary? Yeah, I totally agree. And, you know, psychic surgery is a very quick form of healing. Um, and, you know, Abraham said people in the past, if you need someone to put your hands on you for an hour, go get a massage, you'll get more from it. Um, yeah. And actually, in some cases, that is what people need. Some people need a quick 10 minute session. Some people need someone to listen to them for an hour. Um, and that's why we have so many different healing modalities. Um, even things like mental mediumship is a form of healing. Um, it was just it's just finding what's right for that person. Um, and so there's nothing wrong, I don't think, with anyone going the spiritual route. And I don't think there's anything wrong with someone going the medical route as long yes. as they're, they're open to actually what they're receiving. Because there's a misconception that people go to healers are vulnerable and they're being taken advantage of. But actually, most of the people who go the healing route have gone the medical route, have been let down by the medical route and been told, basically, there's nothing more we can do for you or you've got yeah. to live with this now. And then yeah. they explore the alternative. Yeah, I know. Um... I, when I, I'm connecting with people and my, and the way I work in the physical sense, what you're saying, um, I don't have the, the, like the operation tools as in the surgery side of things, but um, I do the physical as in their loved one will physically close their hand and, and they, they will feel that loved one physically holding their hand tight whilst holding them. And that alone, it brings, it's giving them so much healing and releasing so much from that person 
that what they feel like probably after what you're saying after surgery you feel so different it's it's a way of lifting things so but i'm really intrigued as in your side of things as in the surgery side of things the psychic surgery side of things because i i haven't i'm not as in tune to that as as the other physical side of things uh so when i work it i do work very hands-on um well abraham works very hands-on through me um, when we come into more of the physical side, so Abraham can choose to use me as the, as the medium. Um, he can choose to use me as a conduit, which basically means he uses me to focus the energy, but he'll manifest for himself. Uh, and then he'll work with things like uh, exoplasm and stuff like that. And I mean, physical mediumship, uh, psychic surgery is a form of physical mediumship. If we look at places like Brazil and Philippines, uh, there we're allowed to cut skin. Um, and most of that is done to show people it can be done rather than actually having to cut things out of the body, even though it can be done. Um, so, yeah, so I work very hands on. I don't normally cut. I have cut in the past on the odd time, but it's not something we normally do, especially in the Western world. Um, but, yeah, I am very hands on. What age did you first do your psychic surgery? Your first one? So I started doing the healing, uh, the psychic surgery when I was 18. I was in Manchester in the UK teaching some psychic development. Uh, went to do a bit of spiritual healing with the group um, and started seeing hands go into the body. Um, and then I was researched for five and a half years. Um, and we had a 90% success rate with the research. Um, so it just kind of took off from there, really. I think the team's young. It's, it's, it's young, but it's, you've, you've really trusted and you've just went with, with what you were being guided and you were, what you were sensing. And so that shows you have a, a really strong connection with your spirit team because you just, at that age, you... <laughs> Simple minds make great mediums. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, we all, I suppose, uh, any any medium, whether we're physical or, or mental, we all is surrendering and trust, really, isn't it? It is. But yeah. it's it's amazing to hear at eighteen. Yeah. Gary, can you talk sure. about your other members of your team, like Mrs. Willoughby and Jimmy? And um, and then I have another question about working in the light because I did see you working in the light. And I'm wondering what kind of physical symptoms or after effects that you might have or suffer after doing a lot of physical mediumship. So, so yeah, part of my healing team. And then we've got my physical team. Okay. Uh, now, one difference is I am aware of Abraham. I can talk to Abraham any time of the day. Whereas my physical team, I only know about them through what other people tell me. Um, cause when they're working, I have no awareness of what's going on throughout. Um, so we have Jimmy who tends to be the mouthpiece. He's the master of ceremonies. He'll come through and lead the seances. Uh, we have Mrs. Barnaby who brings through people's loved ones. Um, so she'll act as a medium to build a bridge between our side and their side. And then when that bridge is strong enough, she'll let the loved one come through in some way and, and work. Um, of course we've got, we've got David. He'll pop through every now and then. So he is in charge of the energy. He's not one of the scientists, but he understands my energy better than anyone else. So he has the final say of what experiments do or don't happen. Uh, we've got a range of different scientists that specialize in different types of phenomena. Um, I don't think if we have any else. There's a couple others. I'm just trying to remember who they are. Uh, or what. Um, those are the only ones that I, I got to witness. Um, but I did get to witness your uh, team in action with precipitation art, bringing through the loved ones family members and that was amazing and i understand that's something new for you completely new so precipitation for those who don't know it's where you'll get to put it in very plain terms we have blank paper in the room we have pens pencils ink um, and during the seance an image of, of your loved one will appear on that paper um for you to keep and take home with you um it's something that i never thought i'd ever get um literally when i was in america last time 10 minutes before the first seance started Somebody said, I've got my precipitation box with me tonight. Would you mind if it's in the room? And I said, yeah, okay, just put it under your chair. They'll either use it or they won't use it. <laughs> um, and we had an image of someone's loved one appear that night. And then I think it was seven out of the 10 seances we did had precipitation. Um, it was amazing. Like you could hear, you could hear the papers rustling around. And I think they scrapped one or two, like they, they smashed the paper. They probably didn't like what came out. And, but in the end, there was beautiful images of loved ones. What's great as well is with the images, they continue to develop for about 24 hours. 
So in some of them, the image will get clearer. Uh, in one, we had the image had a woman without glasses, and but within 24 hours, glasses had appeared on her face. Um, names appeared around the picture over 24 hours, um, which is great. So that's after the seance, and it continues to develop. I would like to ask Julie. Julie, you're, you're a physical medium. A developer. Did you ever have, <laughs> did you ever have images or a photo or something like that? What you got from the Senate Masters? I would have you be, had, would I you have be had, able to heal as well? I do do healings. I work with a clinic in California and I do a lot of remote healings. Yes. Um, I've been doing those for about two years, but I, I go into a trance. Personally, I just let myself go and then the healing happens. What about I, images? For images, I've been um, using, I think I've had, I made my first spirit box about four years ago and not much happened, a few little specks. And then I always thought, oh, maybe the, I think the box got moved. Maybe something, you know, accidentally got marked on the card. But I have been um, using one specifically for the last year because I study with Michael Shane. And that was part of our program to learn, you know, to use that. And I have had um, letters with a few different colors and some other markings that were not, that you can, you know, they're not accidental. So I've just saved them, marked down the date and taken them out. And, you know, I put them in my airport cabinet because I feel like it's, it's a form of materialization. So, but um It's something that I never expected to do. And actually, I just thought it would never happen. But, but like Gary said, you never know. Yeah. And what sure. happened to you was <clears throat> marvelous. Marvelous. And can you talk about also Mrs. Willoughby with her materialization? I mean, it was incredible to be able to see a full arm and hand coming out of I believe it was one of those um, portable tents at Neil's house, right? And yeah. literally, it was like solid looking. It was, so, yeah. you know, solid. So we use a pop-up tent as a cabinet. It's mobile, okay. different colors, they're cheap. Um, uh, one experiment the team do do is they will materialize a hand in, in lighted conditions. Um, then in the second part of that experiment, what they'll sometimes do is they'll let your loved ones inspire the hand. Uh, so what that means is the spirit team create the hand and your loved one inspires it with their personality. So as you come up, uh, a lot of people will report that the um, the way they hold the hand, the way they rub the hand, uh, the energy they can feel with the hand is related to their loved one. Um, so we had a seance uh, last night. Yeah, it was last night. Um, and actually they did that experiment in the seance. And, and I remember the guy telling me afterwards um, that he his daughter died and she did something with his hand literally just before she passed. And when she materialized her hand in the sense of science, she repeated that. So he knew it was his daughter. Um, so that's quite a, a good experiment that they've been doing um, successfully. Um, but the good thing as well is things like the precipitation, it's still early days for them. They, they still want to take it much further, uh, which is great. Um, so I'm interested to see where that's going to go. So Can what I, do you I'll, think, I'm sorry, just with no, the presentation, what do you think was uh, inspired it? Do you think because you were in America where they're the famous Bang sisters were, they're famous for their mediumship. I mean, they started out in New York and then lived in Chicago and then went to Indiana, but it's just fascinating. Yeah, especially the precipitation. We, we were in an area where it was rife in the past. So there must have been a lot of residual energy there for spirits to tap into and, and work with. Um, I'm sure it's not an accident that somebody brought their precipitation box 10 minutes before the seance started. Um, spirit have a way of making it work. And actually, sorry, just to answer the previous question uh, that you said about how it affects you. I kind of yeah. say to anyone, don't be a physical medium. <laughs> and I do kind of mean it. Physical mediumship puts a huge drain in your body. Um, and it's not to be all physical mediums have their own uh, side effects that they get, sadly, from working with physical. Um, so for me nowadays, what will happen is uh, about a week or two leading up to my seances, uh, for a week or two afterwards, I will get swollen joints. Um, I will get terrible mouth ulcers. 
Um, and we're talking about 10, 15 mouth ulcers that will hang around for two or three yep. weeks. Um, I will get, especially when we have our testing weeks, um, I will get fever, headaches, uh, body aches throughout the week. Um, it, and then what will happen is I'll get over that. And then two weeks later, it's as if my body will go through a clear through from what it went through. So I'll get all those symptoms again. Um, so it does put a huge strain on the body. And a lot of physical mediums in the past have been affected in multiple ways. Things like diabetes, high blood pressure um, are quite common ones. Why? Can I ask, um, oh, oh, going back to the image, as in what you were explaining, have you ever, not the, the drawing on the paper hasn't, I haven't experienced that, but what I have experienced, um, although I'm completely coherent when I'm doing my physical like yourself, and it's in the light, I don't do my physical in the dark, it's in the light, mm. always in the light. Um, what I have had is like even when the evidential you're doing both together, you don't remember because it's not for you to remember. It's it's for that that person. But I've had um, people contact me and say, "You told me to look at the photograph," and okay. and I would go, "Okay, what well, what was about the photo?" And the they they were moving their their loved ones were moving in the, the photographs. Okay. So it wasn't it wasn't on paper, but it was it was actual photographs, and okay. they could see they could see this their image their, their facial expressions expressions changing everything. So it's a, in a sense it's similar, but just mm -hmm. they seem to be doing it through photographs, which I thought was amazing. I'm sure it's amazing to see. Um, but I, I the, the paper and the pen is quite interesting too. It's it's amazing yeah. how they all try different things. But do you, you work all in the light or in between both? Um, a mixture. So normally I will start in the dark. Um, a lot of the seances do tend to be in, in light for most of it, but uh, we do have periods that are still dark for them to build the energy or do certain experiments. Yeah. Have you always worked in the light, Gary, or when did you start working in the light? Um, I think from the early days we did have some experiments that were – in red light uh, but i think from what i can remember i think the majority of them were mostly dark um it's more been the last couple of years that uh, majority of the seance tend to be more in light conditions rather than dark or they're definitely working towards more lighted condition experiments and you yes. were ecto ectoplasm and photoplasm correct yeah. so they predominantly work with ectoplasm um, and what they'll do is they will coat the ectoplasm in photoplasm when they're going to work in light so that it's the photoplasm that's getting dispersed, not the ectoplasm itself. They're very much evolving and they want to be seen in the light. They want everything um, modern days in a sense. They're they're moving up with the times, I feel. I know the spirit yes. would explain that to me. In some groups, yes. Um, so I always say to people that definitely we should always try to work towards the light, but don't neglect the benefit you can get from the dark because light yeah. does disperse energy. So some people do need that dark to let it build and let it grow. Um, and sometimes if you can let your team develop that in the dark, then when they come to the light, it's much easier. Others, depending on what your team's working on, others may be going straight for the light. Now we've got some physical teams that are still working with bringing through evidence of loved ones. We've got some physical teams that don't bring loved ones through at all. All they do is purely experimental. Um, and they may work more with our scientists or technology so it will come back to working with the loved ones. Um, but yes, different physical groups are working different. And as you were saying, they're trying the same experiments, but in different ways with different groups. Yeah. I would and say really following the guidance too, your spirit team, what they want you to do, really. Yeah, I mean, they're the it? ones doing it. So we should be asking them first and foremost, but you'd be amazed how many people don't do that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, true, true. So Gary, sure. you had a full, sorry, you had a full materialization at one of your seances, and I was lucky enough to be able to, um, this entity, the spirit, actually walked all around to all of us sitters. And I mean, he was, it was so solid. And they took our hands and we were able to place our hands on the spirit's chest. Beautiful. So we could see how solid and, you know, tall. And it was incredible. And it was that part was totally in the dark, and that's understandable. So, how much more ectoplasm does it take to be a solid being walking in the room as opposed to a semi transparent being that you might see with your eyes? 
so in theory, it shouldn't require much more. Because even if you see a full form, they actually haven't developed a full form. Uh, they've only created a mass, and then from that mass, they'll create limbs or or the idea of full form. So this is why when we see physical mediumship, especially in the past, they will come out cloaked so that you're not seeing just a floating head. Um, but often in experiments, they'll lift their cloaks up and you can see there's nothing underneath, there's no feet and things like that. Um, you'll hear a lot of seances they'll talk about with other physical mediums that actually when you hear them walking around the room, they're not actually walking around the room, they're just creating that as a phenomena to give the impression. Um, so in theory, it shouldn't take any more explosive. Um, but then, you know, we've had a couple of, of, of seances where we've done where they've done the right. Um, and it's just, it's more if the energy's right and the strain it's going to put on the body. Um, but if the conditions are right, it, it should be able to be done. Do you find that you have a preference now that you, you work some in, in the dark, as you said, with ectoplasm? Um, I've always been about light, but now you're doing a lot with the light. Would, would you have a preference as to which way you enjoy working um, more now? No, I mean, I, I kind of I appreciate the benefits of both. For me, like there are some physical mediums out there that will know in advance what phenomena they're going to attempt that night, which is great. Uh, for me, I don't get that luxury. Literally, I show up with, with everything <laughs> um, and it, it's literally open. They will, I can't say what they will or not do tonight. So even like Mrs. Barnaby, she'll normally come through in one every five or six seances, but I don't know which seance that's going to be. Um, so it's really, yeah, I literally just sit and then get told afterwards what happened. You just go for it. You trust what they're what you can just Literally, go for. Yeah. That's 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 the best way, really, isn't it? Um but yes. Mrs. Barnaby, what what about Mrs. Barnaby? Can you do you know about her past, a lot about her past or so Mrs. Barnaby isn't her real name, she's made clear. We we think we know who she is, we think she was a, a medium from the past. Uh but because she works with different circles to avoid egos and things like that, she just uses the pseudo name of Mrs. Barnaby. Um, and so she's got a good experience with uh, mediumship. It's, it's her experience, it's what she understands with energy, she understands that with ectoplasm. So she, if you think your loved one doesn't have the experience of working with ectoplasm, she will create that bridge so that somebody who doesn't know how to use ectoplasm can use ectoplasm. Yeah. So it's, so it's not her real name, it's just, just well, I always, my spirit look, a lot of the time, the spirit will just let you go by any name sometimes, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> they don't. There's not always a specific name. I mean, I could call Abraham Bob and he'd still work. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and sometimes we pay too much attention to who the names are or who the guide is. Uh, yeah. And, you know, you get people who then are obsessed with being Henry VIII or channeling Henry VIII rather than the scullery maid. You're scientists. You were saying you. I would like scientists. to ask you all three a question. I would like to ask you all three a question. In all your times, there were many gods we prayed to, but there's only one who is real. Who created the other ones? Did we do it because we believe, or we, be uh, we believed they exist, or they were there before? Okay. All right. Well, when you're saying that I'm being told it's it's a bit of ego, I'm being told sometimes ego comes into play as in a hierarchy that we fear others, we, we see them as a god, but they're not necessarily a god. Um, as I'm being told, I'm taught, I've always been taught it doesn't matter how far somebody is or we are on our journeys. We're all equal. We're exactly the same. Um, but we, even in modern days, we still have people who um, look upon others as higher, as, as more higher, not a hierarchy. But, um, but I do believe that we do have a lot of universal beings that came forward at different times and they did make a big impact around, mm -hmm. around the, the earth skull. 
let me specify my questions and uh, my question a little bit more. Uh, we know the Aztecs and the Mayan culture, they had different gods, the Egyptian culture as well. And I heard in some sessions from Hans Otto Koenig, I don't know, I'm not sure if you know this name, it is uh, a German one in the 80s, he developed um, tools, machines to speak with the spirit world. And there was one message that said, if we speak about gods, they, we, we, we make them, or we make them that they exist in the astral realm, but they exist for a specific time and then they appear in nothing, because they disappear in nothing, because only we believe that they exist. But in the spirit, in the astral realm, they really exist. They are intelligent. They influence uh, human beings in real. So my question is, if we speak about spirits, is there some, sometimes someone who we created because we have the spark of God in us, that we are creators of beings, they interact as well with us. And I don't speak about it as only fantasy. No, they exist in real, but they disappear as well, like we made them real. And we are interacting with them in a specific way and they can do things for us like Abraham. Don't get me wrong, Gary. I don't say Abraham is, uh, you made him. No, 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 I don't think so. I was only wondering where we can say, well, this we create and this is a creation of God. So we, like the Abraham thing. So it's a theory that's been posed before and, and I can't disprove. So uh, a researcher once said to me, how do you know that Abraham isn't your higher self? But the way that you have to understand it is you have to create it as a separate personality, almost like a bit of schizophrenia. It's entirely possible. That could be how my brain perceives it. It could be my higher self. And that's how I tap into my higher knowledge. We've got theories like super ESP theory where all the information's out there and we're just tapping into it. Um, now, on the physical level, when it comes to gods, you're going to have some that are created purely by man for uh, control. Uh, you know, like uh, the Catholic Church says you can't get divorced and you want to get divorced if you're a king. So you go and create your own religion where divorce is fine. Um, and then on the spiritual, from what Abraham would say, that any god has its place within the spirit world. If you pray, there's going to be an intelligence there that will vibrate with that energy. But when you're looking at the bigger picture, we all make up God uh, when it all kind of comes together. But <laughs> Whether you want to believe in Jesus or Buddha, there's a space for it in the spirit world. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's really because everybody's journey is so different and unique. And it's what helps their growth and on what helps their development in each individual and their journeys. Because we all have individual paths. We're all going to the same place, but we still all have individual um, paths and abilities and purposes we were here to fulfill. Julie. So I do believe in spiritual hierarchy, like in the one creator, okay, or as in the ascended masters and angels and their hierarchy. Although I do believe in ancient times, like the Egyptians, I feel like some of the multidimensionals who had at their, um, you know, at their back, they had these uh, super vehicles, superpowers that came here from other galaxies, okay? So I think that's why they were considered gods or goddesses. They came with uh, a lot of knowledge that no one had here in those pagan times. And I do feel like there are so many religions and so many different beliefs so we can all find something to feel comfortable with on our own spiritual path. But personally, I believe in spiritual hierarchy and, um, and that we are all God. We are all of God. 
So we are in his image and anything. You know, we have the power and the intelligence, but it's, it's, it's creating the right circumstances. It's living in a higher vibration, which in these times, it's hard to do. But I think sometimes what you're saying about the angels and the hierarchy, I, I work really strongly with the angels. I, 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 have a, I love the angels and I'm very close with the angels. But a lot of people dismiss them because they see one image, to, you know, as in like Archangel Michael, as I was talking to Marcus about this, you know, people see Archangel Michael and the, the sword, the shield. And, and yes, that's fine if that's what is in their saying. But I, also our archangels are beings of light. They, they can come in many forms. They can come in, in light forms. Um, and I, with my spirit team, I work with universal guides also that, are not of this this earth and never have been um and there is ones and i know everybody maybe is into that or believes that but they do walk amongst us still they, in a different parallel they do still walk amongst us mm. so they do yeah. and i believe they're part of the ascended masters mm -hmm. and they can uh keep reincarnating and have different uh spirits and keep evolving and helping us here yeah and do you not think there's more, but before the Ascended Masters, guy. I was just going to say, uh, some of the most spiritual people I've met, though, are not religious. <laughs> right, right, That's right. It's not a religious thing. It's just a spiritual thing. Yeah. Because every religion speaks of angels and speaks of, you know, those higher beings. I don't care if you're, if it's Jewish or you're reading the Kabbalah or um, Muslim. They all have the angels, so. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And there's proof enough that they have to exist. When we go back in time, how far we can go, they speak about higher beings. And mm -hmm. these cultures were not connected to this time. Yeah, as well in Lemuria and Mu and all these old yeah. uh, cultures, they disappeared thousands of years ago. Uh, they speak about angelic beings. And, 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 and so if the church is speaking about it, tells me not uh, it is must be the truth, it tells me only that they are open, that this exists. Because church and religion and this, um, well, we can discuss about it and we can disagree with many, many things, what the church did in the name of God and other um, religions or belief systems are more near to this what I think expect God from us that we do or we 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 um, get higher and higher, and we feel more and more love for each other and protecting each other. I don't speak about the human beings. I speak about that we protect and love all what ex exists. If it is a little bird, a worm, a dog. My neighbor, I hate, I love to hate, nothing real. But we find, <laughs> that we find back. Are you that leaving that one back, in? <laughs> <laughs> that we find back to the root of what is in us, this spark of God. Mm -hmm. What about light well, language? Well, can I hear guys take on light language? Do you, because I'm, I'm, my, I'm guided and like universal beings as well as the different ones um and we all i'm my guys talk about we all know the universal language we've just forgot it um so what what would your take be on that i so i think they must please so, I, was gonna say, I i'd say it's very similar probably to sound healing it's mm -hmm. it's like another way of the vibration that yes, is going to be some people yeah. There must there must exist a general language because um, if you are into ITC and you make recordings, you will every time hear voices in the languages you speak. I can go, for example, to China. I will get my EVPs in German. A Chinese person can go to Germany. He will get the EVPs in his. So own that would be. That or that should be because you are acting as the medium. So this is one one misconception we get when we look at things like spirit photography, 
it's not the uh, medium in the picture that is creating the phenomena. It's the person taking the picture. So if you're creating that phenomena, it should be in a way that your database, your understanding should be. So it should be in a language that you would understand. We mm -hmm. influence that energy in some way. Yeah, because mm -hmm. yeah, I've done readings for um, uh, Indian, uh, can only speak, their loved ones could only speak Indian, you know, they're, um, but they come through and talk to me in my language um, so that I'm, you're able to pass on and, and so that makes that makes perfect sense because that's what I would experience too. I, I had many many years ago an EVP. They were speaking someone Russian on it. I can't speak Russian, but I can identify it. And um, he he seemed to be he wasn't a bad guy. And there was another language. He said, "No, you go to hell because you were a bad guy." And 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 he want he was he were asking for for help, but. Hell doesn't exist in the way how we think it should be with uh, devils and uh, torturing people and 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 so it's our levels of let us say um, an environment what is maybe good to live in or less good to live in, and so um, yeah it is it's very interesting sometimes to see in how far we can interact with the other side and. Even so, it seems to be very difficult to understand how life will be after our reincarnation. Is every time a very interesting topic to discuss about. But we are running out of time. I Can I ask one last question? One last question to Gary? Yes. Yes. Okay. So in your healing work, Gary, have you ever worked with anybody in their mental illness, like people hearing voices? Because the EVPs, that reminded me that nowadays people are actually, mediums working, you know, holistically with these types of people are actually able to record some of the EVPs to prove these people really are hearing voices or attachments, if you want to call it. So. Yes. Yeah. So I always say whenever we work with mental illness, it's not the illness working with, it's the, it's the person. Um, now, some people may be experiencing um, mental illness due to a chemical imbalance or hormonal. So it could be purely physical. And we can't rule out that, you know, even if we look at things like The Exorcist, it was based on a young boy who had schizophrenia. Uh, so that became the focal point for his illness. Um, in a lot of cases, I do think it's just someone who's oversensitive, who probably is hearing spirit. Uh, and in some parts of the world, you know, if we look at Brazil, the circus movement in Brazil, there, hearing voices is you would look at things like mediumship for development. Um, and actually, in the UK, we had a really good TV program a couple of years ago called Am I Normal? Mm -hmm. And in it, uh, this guy said, I was brought up in a religious community, and I was told it was okay to hear voices. It was the voice of God. He goes, and then as soon as I left that community, told people to hear voices, I got I got sectioned. He goes, but I don't understand why can a priest or a nun say that they hear the voices and it's God, but I can't. Um, but yeah, I do think in a lot of cases, people are just sensitive uh, and aware of spirit and it's getting misdiagnosed as uh, mental illness. And we can see that a lot with things like ADHD, autism. Uh, you know, we see with physical mediumship, if someone's not releasing their energy, it's going to keep building. Um, so there needs to be an outlet in some way. Can I just follow in on that, what you're explaining as, as uh, the exorcist, the film, and um, my grandson, he's nine, and um, he he's very spiritual. He's very, very open, you know, as a young, I know he's younger than you, but 13, but he's very spiritual in the sense that he hears things, and, and he'll say to me, and what, the thing I love the most about it, he'll say to me is, Nanny, I don't really care if I'm different to everybody else because I know I hear them. And my angel, he, he um, we did this. Sorry. He painted me this. Because, mm. um, so he painted me that. And the deal was he would paint me the angel he sees every night um, watching over him. And I would paint him Mickey Mouse. <laughs> and But yet he still says to me, the angel's in my Mickey Mouse painting, still in my room. But I, I encourage him to be open about it because when people don't understand our children are the, those generations going forward. And if we can 
build on that knowledge. When I was a child, I didn't, nobody understood me. They thought I was an over-imaginative girl. You know, they couldn't hear, they couldn't see what I was doing. But I learned from that. And I, I, my passion, a lot of my passion is helping children because it's important that when they have that support network, that they're going to keep that gift. They're not, they're going to be understood and they're not going to be scared. Um, like you say, so many misdiagnosed and it's because they weren't understood. And yeah, that's a good point to end on, really, isn't it? <laughs> How can people get in touch with you? Um, so the quickest way to get a hold of me is through Facebook. Um, I do have a website, but I haven't updated it in a year or two, so I really need to do that. Uh, so the quickest is probably just add me on Facebook. Thank you. Or in the description of our video, we will get all what is necessary for your getting in touch with you, your websites, events, and, and, and have a look what is in the description of this video. I say thank you to Gary Mannion and Julie Adriani, Judith Miller. It was nice to listen to you as co-moderator, and it was so interesting. Gary, thank you so much that you had time for us. Take care and see you guys the next time when it is time for the Paranormal Quartet from Mexico. Goodbye. Bye. Take, take care.